Here we are in the Mark series, part 34. This is going to be Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. This is Jesus and his teaching on the sanctity of marriage. And really, I think if I could summarize it, I'd say Jesus is trying to restore our hearts on the topic of marriage. And that's what he's doing for the people of his time. But while I did a three hour long video on, on all of what the Bible teaches on marriage, what I didn't do in that video is a thorough verse by verse treatment of Mark chapter 10. And since we're in the Mark series, I thought I still need to do this. We still have to go through it verse by verse. So Mark chapter 10 verses one through 12, see this in the context of the whole gospel of Mark. And I'll share some info here that I didn't share in that long three hour marathon teaching where I uh, taught everything the Bible says about uh, divorce and remarriage. So here we are, Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Let's just read verse 1, and we'll get started. Getting up, he went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. Crowds gathered around him again, and according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. So one of the first things you should ask as you're, as you're doing a study of Mark 10 is getting up from where and going to where. Where is he coming from and where is he going to? This is kind of him on the journey. What happens in Mark 10 is all in the sandwich of a journey where he was somewhere and he's going somewhere. So where he was is Capernaum. We get that in Mark chapter 9, verse 33. Where he's heading to is Jericho. Now Capernaum is in Galilee. This is in the Galilee area up in the north of Galilee. And that's where Jesus kind of like had his, his base of operations for his ministry. But Jericho is down way further south and Jericho is like right near Jerusalem. It's the last stop on the way to Jerusalem. So he's leaving Galilee and he's leaving Galilee permanently in the Gospel of Mark. He's not coming back. So this is kind of a big deal. Now he's going to be preaching in other areas on his way down to Jericho. This kind of happens on his way to Jericho. He's in the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Well, okay, so if you're looking at a map of Israel, you have the Sea of Galilee up here. You've got Jerusalem down here and I'll invert it in my head so I could kind of draw it for you. And here you've got Galilee, you've got Jerusalem and you have the Jordan River here. He's going to cross over the Jordan River, come down and then cross over to go to Jericho and then Jerusalem. This was like a path that they would sometimes take. One of the reasons why he crosses over, like why cross over, it seems like you're going around. You go past the Jordan River, go around to come back to Jerusalem. One of the reasons for crossing over, the Jews at that time would do it to avoid some, uh, Samaria. They didn't want to be around Samaria. The Samaritans were viewed as like these sort of half-breeds and they did not get along, right? Remember the story of the Good Samaritan, how shocking that was to the people. Well, actually, when we read in Luke, I believe it's Luke, where Jesus goes and he actually does go past Samaria, tries to go through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem for this final visit to Jerusalem, and they won't allow him. And so he has to go around. So it's, what Mark doesn't tell you, we get filled in other gospels, is Jesus did try to head through Samaria again and was rejected by them. And the context, though, is he was rejected by them just before the Jews also rejected him. He's being rejected is the theme that's going on in this season of Jesus's ministry. Now, technically, the area where Jesus is, is Perea or Perea, and that, that's beyond the Jordan there, just down south of Galilee and to the uh, east of the Jordan. But to a fisherman from Galilee, it's likely that they would have just called it Judea, as, he, as it does here in Mark, because it's in southern Israel and southern, going down south of Galilee, oh yeah, that's Judea area to them. They didn't have like these careful, oh, you crossed the boundary. You know how we are. We're like, if you go across the street, you're in Downey. If you if you go to this side over here, you're, you're, you're in Bellflower. Over here, you go that way, you're in Paramount. Like we, we have actually specific spots where you cross the street, but they were a lot more loose with their geography than we are. So it does sort of fit well with Mark's major source being Peter, a fisherman from Galilee, to refer to this as the region of Judea. Now let me talk to you guys about the flow of Mark to catch us up. It's been a while since we've been at Mark together. So the flow of the Gospel of Mark at this point is now heading to the cross. Jesus is heading to the cross. This has not been the case earlier on in the Gospel of Mark. When we got to chapters 8 and 9, it's where Jesus, for the first time, speaks openly about the cross, his rejection, his death, and his resurrection. That's eight, chapters 8 and 9. He first talks about it. It doesn't open the book that way. It suddenly comes up in chapters 8 and 9 because we're shifting things. In chapter 10, right here, he leaves Galilee not to, ever to return, never to return to Galilee again, at least not until after his resurrection. He does have an appearance in Galilee, probably the appearance of the 500. So he's on his way to the cross. In chapter 11, it's his triumphal entry. 
when we get to chapter 11. That's where he enters into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, and that begins the last week of Jesus. So from chapter 11 on, we're in the last week of Jesus. So we have his whole ministry coming to a close very quickly here in the Gospel of Mark. In, um, so let me, let me give you a quick overview of the Gospel of Mark. This is a simplification, but sometimes when we simplify a book, it just gives us a, I don't know, gives us like a grip around the book itself. So in Mark, chapters 1 through 7, I will summarize as, who is Jesus? Chapters 1 through 7 gives who Jesus is. And so he shows us who he is through his teachings, but also through the miracles he does. It shows us that he's Messiah, but also that he's Yahweh, he's God with us. And there's all these incredible pictures in the stuff that Jesus does, the way he does it, really intricate stuff that the Jewish mind would have understood. In chapters 8 through 10, we get how Jesus will save us. Starting in chapter 8, he's like, I'm going to die. Boom, big revelation, okay? Remember, they didn't expect this. I'm going to die and rise again. How he saves us. That's 8 through 10. In chapters 11 through 13, we have an explanation for what about Israel and what about the expectations of Israel. Remember, they thought their Messiah was going to come in and reign. And so we need to explain why these expectations are incorrect and what Jesus is really going to do. So that's what we get in chapters 11 through 13. They have false expectations. They're not going to see Jesus rule and reign in his first coming. That's his second coming. And Jesus is going to explain his first and second coming in those chapters. Then in chapters 14 through 16, we have the death and the resurrection of Christ. If not for the earlier chapters showing who Jesus is, how Jesus saves, and what about Israel and their expectations, if we didn't have those three sections, you wouldn't really understand the cross. It would be a weird story. So we have to understand Mark is communicating that there's a wholeness of the gospel that's being communicated specifically in a Jewish context. And that's what gives us, I think, insight. With the earlier teaching about who Jesus is, how he saves us, and then about Israel's expectations. With all that teaching there, you should not misunderstand the cross. He's, he's the Lamb of God who's taking away the sin of the world. And here's why he's not fitting their expectations. Now, here's a question I have. Um, if this is the case, and Mark is largely about, you know, who Jesus is, how he's going to save us, and all that kind of stuff. Why is this extended teaching on marriage and divorce just stuck in the middle of Mark where he's shifting on his on the road to Jerusalem? Well, part of the reason is going to be because this is when it happened, right? Like it happened when he was on his way to Jerusalem. This is when the event happened. So this is when we hear it recounted in Mark as well as other gospels. But I think that what it does do for us is it teaches us not only about marriage, about divorce. I think it teaches, teaches us about the high calling we have to live our lives for Christ. That God isn't just looking for us to, to live based upon an analysis of rules. And usually people, when they criticize the rules of religion, they're criticizing religion because they think religion is too strict. But inevitably, when Jesus encountered the rules of religion and even set aside man's traditions, he made it more strict. And he showed us the heart behind it was for holiness in God's people. And that, I think, is what he's doing with marriage. He shows that, that their, their rules were actually giving them excuses to sin. And he wants to draw the heart towards God's heart for marriage and the fullness of it. So verse 2, we read, Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And now I got to get into the backdrop because they all know the backdrop. There's a big debate going on in their day on the topic of marriage. And we don't, if we don't know it, we don't understand the question they're asking Jesus. There's two schools of thought amongst the Jews. And they're named after these two rabbis. There was a rabbi named Hillel. And he was like sort of teaching the Jews. He was like the guy back in the day, BC time, right? After he died in the same century before Christ, actually the first century before Christ, when he died, the next guy took over. His name was Shemai. And they had agreement on most issues, but they had several issues of disagreement. Then we have Jews who decide, I'm more like, I'm a Shemai guy. I'm a Hillel guy. And they develop these schools of thought that are named after the rabbis that sort of started them. And they, these schools of thought debate, and they go back and forth on all kinds of issues. All kinds of issues. Things like about the Sabbath or things about um, marriage and divorce and when you can get a divorce, that kind of thing. So at the time, the school of Shemai and the school of Hillel are debating on the topic of when you can rightly get a divorce. And the whole debate centers around one, one passage in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 24. It's only four verses. So we're going to read these four verses, Deuteronomy 24, to try to see 
um, what their debate is based on. And as you read it, try to think like you're one of them. You're a Jew of the first century and you're thinking, when am I allowed to get a divorce from my wife? And they think this verse, this passage answers the question. So here we go, Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, and here's the key phrase, because he has found some indecency in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies her, um, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, the first guy, who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now, I have more details on Deuteronomy 24 in my big, long three-hour teaching. I will link that in the video description for anybody who's interested. You can check it out there. But here's the bottom line. They thought this passage was teaching them when it was okay to get a divorce. So they argued over specifically the phrase in verse 1 where it says, he has found some indecency in her. And so Hillel and Shemai, these schools, they both agreed that this was the key phrase. Whatever's meant by some indecency, that is when you're allowed to get a divorce. So notice this, that it was the husband who could do the divorce, not the wife. But they thought, hey, whatever some indecency is, that's when you can divorce. And then here's how they would split the debate. The house of Shemai, they would think the phrase in the word indecency was the center of this concept. And you have to be like, Whatever your wife did, it was indecent or unchaste. Or in Hebrew, you could translate it as a matter of nakedness. So some sort of sexual inappropriateness going on. Uh, adultery would fit the bill. But also Shemai would say that if your wife went around with her hair disheveled and her arms uncovered, that was a sign in their time. That was like an outward symbol that you were, you were available. You were like prostitution type symbol. And they said if she even goes around like that or if she's alone with a man, then you can get a divorce because that's an indecent thing, a nakedness issue. That was the Shemai school. They were pretty strict. The, the Hillel school, they didn't focus on the word indecency. They focused on the word some. He found some indecency in her, or depending on your translation, it could be indecency in her in anything. And they focused on the word anything. You found indecency in her in anything. So you can divorce her for anything if you find that indecent. Do you see how it becomes very flexible for them? It's like you can divorce whatever you want. Now, I'm going to read to you. This is actually a translation of their debate. It's in the Talmud, in the Jewish Talmud. This is in the Hebrew writings that we that they still follow today. It's Mishnah Gittin and um, 9.10, chapter 9, verse 10. This is, this is the section. So here's their debate. And it is written a little funny, so I'll just, just try to store this in your mind for a second. The house of Shemai say, a man should, not, uh, a man should divorce his wife only because he's found grounds for it in unchastity. Since it is said, because he has found in her indecency in anything. Deuteronomy 24.1. Now here's the other side, right? So they think they have pretty a more strict policy for divorce. Hillel is different. And the house of Hillel say, even if she spoiled his dish, she ruined his dinner. Even if she spoiled his dish, and then they give their justification. Since it is said, because he has found in her indecency in anything. And you see how they both quote the same verse, but they emphasize different words. You know, Shemai emphasizes indecency, Hillel emphasizes anything. Then, and usually in the Mishnah, when they have an, a debate, an argument, the person who speaks last is the one who has the weightier argument or the one who kind of wins. Well, here's the last person to speak is a third guy named Rabbi Akiba. And he says, even if he found someone else prettier than she, since it is said, and it shall be, uh, and it shall be if she find no favor in his eyes. And, and that, that is his interpretation is, oh no, forget the phrase, some indecency. There's another verse, there's another section before that. He finds no favor in his eyes. So he doesn't like her anymore. So this is the debate that is going on when Jesus is walking the earth. And when they say, is it lawful for man to divorce his wife? What they really are saying is, is Hillel right that a man can divorce her anytime she wants and that divorce is basically the right of a husband to be enacted anytime he wants? That's the, that's the question they're asking. Now, to add more weight to this, 
it seems as though during the time of Jesus that this any matter divorce, they call it an any matter or anything divorce, divorce for any reason you want, that this kind of divorce had become the most common way divorce was actually done in real life. Like the normal people were using this mat, this form of divorce. We read about it in Philo and Josephus. Uh, Philo's before Christ, Josephus will be after Jesus, writing after Jesus. And in both of them, they mention that divorce can be done for any reason. And so we have two different guys writing in different locations who are saying the same thing from that Jewish mindset. So that's the point. This is a debate about Matthew, about Deuteronomy 24. And when in Mark 2, they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What you could interpret this to mean is, is it simply a man's right to say, I divorce you whenever he wants? Is it a right of a husband? Divorce is a right. That's, that's really how they're viewing it. In Mark 10, 4, it says Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. The way that they summarize Moses, right? Moses, yeah, Moses allowed a man to do this. So a man has a right to do this. He can do whatever he wants. Their view is seen right there. Any reason they want, they can get a divorce. This is the popular view of the time. And this is very important. This is what Jesus absolutely rejects. You can't just divorce for whatever reason you want. It's not a right. And this is the context of his later statements when he goes on in this chapter and he talks about committing adultery. The scenario is you divorced for any reason you wanted and then you got married, that was adultery. That's the context of that statement. So it's not that Jesus is opposed to any and every possible divorce. It's rather that he is opposed to divorce for any and every possible reason. That would be my short summary of that. Um, now this debate gives us one reason to see that Mark has a summary of an ongoing and specific debate question in the first century in Israel, right? Knowing that this background is there, that these rabbis in the in one first century BC, were their, their schools were debating still in the first century AD, and then they're encountering Jesus, asking him about it. This is what we get, and we can support this with uh, Matthew 19, 3. Because if we see Jesus's statement on marriage in context of this debate, it does change how we see what Jesus is saying. Slightly. We still see his main points the same, but we, we no longer think he's ruling out every possible reason for divorce and saying you can never get a divorce under any circumstances. He's just saying, pun on words here, you can't just get a divorce for any reason. That's what he's saying, that that's what's wrong. Uh, but Matthew 19.3, they actually seem to quote the same things that the, uh, the Hillelites were saying. It says, so some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And Matthew is just giving us more details, right? The, the Jews who read this originally in Mark might have just known what he meant. Matthew's giving us more details. So the next question I have when I'm studying the Gospels is, but is Matthew giving us more details on the same conversation? Or is this a different time they talked about marriage and divorce, right? Is Matthew really giving us more details? I can read that on the Mark as well. Well, it is actually a parallel passage. Let's read Matthew 19, 1 through 3, and we'll see the travel details mean that the stuff in Matthew 19 is the same conversation as, as Mark chapter 10. It says in Matthew 19, 1, when Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Same place, right? Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? There's also another uh, thing to support this theory, that this is clearly the debate. The context of Jesus' statement is the Hillel and Shimei debates. And that is that Matthew, it's normal for him, whenever he talks about the same thing Mark does, whenever he has the same account as Mark, he usually makes it longer. He usually adds some kind of details. So he tends to offer more details where he overlaps with Mark. So in this case, he's doing the same thing. He's, he's uh, giving us some details that we don't have in Mark about it being for any reason at all. Good. Let me, let me wrap all that up in a bow, <laughs> with a bow, I should say, and give you the bottom line. The question they're asking Jesus is not, Jesus, can a man ever get a divorce? The question they're asking is, can a man get a divorce for any reason he wants? That's the question. When we put it in that context, all of a sudden, the super strict policy that no Christian can ever get a divorce it doesn't seem to be what Jesus is talking about. I don't think that that's what he's talking about at all.
and I'll, I'll explain more of that here, but also my big giant video has all kinds of details that people can have, and they may want to watch that. It, may, it seems like th it's a three-hour video, but if divorce matters to you, it's going to be worth it for your time to get all that the scripture says about it. All right, let's look at verses five through nine, <clears throat> and we'll see how Jesus answers the question. The question is, is divorce the unqualified right of a husband? That's the question. And it's, un just so you know ahead of time, he doesn't side with Shemai or Hillel. He has his own teaching on this topic. That's my understanding of Jesus here. In verse 5, it says, But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. That was not certainly the Hillel or Shemai view. They didn't think this was some permission because of hardness of hearts. They thought it was a right. Verse 6, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I'll just mention real quick that there are those who think that divorce is literally impossible. This is the Catholic position, right? Divorce um, is just not a, a thing that can happen. But Jesus here doesn't say what God has joined together, man cannot separate. He says, let not man separate. He's saying that a general policy for divorce is you stay together. That is it. And that should be the rule for marriage, right? The general rule is you stay together. I do think there are legitimate exceptions, but they are the few and far between in extreme situations. They're not the norm. So how does Jesus answer the debate? He answers their debate between Sh Shammai and Hillel. And he says this effectively, he says, this is not the permission you think it is. Deuteronomy 24 isn't telling you when it's okay to get a divorce. It was written because of the hardness of your hearts. So this is a law that's given because you're going to get divorced. So here's a policy that regulates it, but that doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it okay. And we should know this when we read the Old Testament law. Some of the policies that were regulating things weren't saying that those things were good. I think that's a really important principle that we look at the Old Testament law. We recognize God gave them some things because of the hardness of their hearts. So it's not a right to divorce. Instead, it's a rule that says when you divorce, since you're going to do it anyways, this is what happens. Let's look at it again with that in context because Deuteronomy 24, if you didn't know about the Hillel Shemai debate, you never would have thought this was telling you when it was okay to divorce. What it is, and we're going to read it again, but let me preface it with this. It's like an if then scenario. If this, 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 and this happens, then here's the ruling. And that's all we're getting in Deuteronomy 24. It's not when you can get a divorce at all. So let's read it with that in context. It says here in verse 1, When a man takes a wife, this is the when, here's a scenario, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and... She leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then it's an if-then scenario, right? We got the if. She gets, she gets a divorce. She gets married to someone else. He dies or divorces her. Then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she's been defiled. For that's an abomination before the Lord. And so what we're getting here is a text that's saying you can't have your wife go become another man's husband and then come back and become your wife again. Now, this could be for a variety of reasons. Why is this the policy? Um, <clears throat> it's possible, and I lean this way. I don't know for sure if it's, if it's true, but it's possible that there is um, a type of prostitution going on where they would send his, you'd send your wife away and they have like an overnight marriage. I divorce you, wife, and you go and you sleep with that man and then he goes, I divorce you, and then you come back, and now you're mine again. And, and you might think, well, that's far-fetched, but they do this even now in the Middle East. It's like a problem in, in Islam, where they would do, the, they do these like 24-hour marriages so they could sleep with women and call it moral. And so this would, this would mean that she can't even come back to him as a husband, which, which would be for her benefit in that case, in my opinion, in that kind of situation. But, um, but yeah, it's not at all a teaching on when divorce is okay. It's rather an if-then scenario with a ruling about a woman going back to her former husband after having a second husband. That's it. It doesn't even say she can't marry a third husband. It just can't be him. She can marry a third husband in this scenario as well, just not the same original husband. And there could be other reasons for that. So this is the popular view 
um, during their time is that it gives a reason for divorce, but it, Jesus seems to reject it. He just seems to outright reject it. So Jesus, the way he answers the debate is not to side with Hillel or Shemai. He says, look, the reason Moses wrote this wasn't as like an analysis of when you can get a divorce. It was just because you're going to get divorced because of the hardness of your hearts. Ideally, with two Christians, there is never going to be a need for divorce because Christians means they're following Christ. Because two people following Jesus, living for Jesus, would never have a good reason to get a divorce. Ideally. But as we know from 1 Corinthians, the ideal isn't always the reality in a church, right? Or even in a, Christ, a Christian marriage. And how many people have gotten married to someone because they were Christian? I only know I only know them for 10 minutes, but I know they're a believer and they love the Lord, so let's get married. What could go wrong? Well, I mean, they're not Jesus, so I mean... <laughs> And so things can go uh, pretty, pretty scary. But ideally, if two people are following Jesus, their marriage will be okay. I mean, that, that I think is a safe claim to make. But unfortunately, having the name Christian doesn't mean you're following Christ. So this is totally different than how Hillel and Shemai handle the debate. Jesus does not look to the concession um, of divorce in Deuteronomy as a right to divorce. He sidesteps that debate or he reframes it they assumed that some uncleanness in her gave a ruling on when divorce was like morally permissible. Um, the Shemaites interpret it pretty strictly. The Hillelites interpret it super liberally. Jesus, instead, he moves away from Deuteronomy and he goes where? Genesis. And he says, when you want to talk about marriage, you need to go to Genesis. Genesis 1 verse 27 and 2 verse 24. Those are the two verses Jesus quotes. These verses are the heart of the issue to Jesus. The heart of the issue. Before you think about divorce, you should be thinking about this. God created man in his own image. In the, in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And 2.24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The nature of marriage is such that you don't want to be going, when can I get out of this thing? Like, it's sacred. It's, it's, it's holy. It's this amazing union that God has created us for, and so we should be making it work. That's that is absolutely where my heart should start with all these issues. Now, let me give you guys a side note. I'm going to, a side note, because if you notice, when Jesus talks about, um, he quotes Genesis, he actually quotes it differently than the way you have it, and in, which is okay. You don't have to have a word-for-word -word quote every time you're talking about scripture, but Jesus uses the word to become one flesh instead of they become one flesh. And that is a clue that something's going on with the teaching of Jesus that centers around a different debate that was going on at the time about polygamy. So let me just point it out to you first. In Mark, we have Jesus says, saying they're no longer two but one flesh. They're no longer two but one flesh. Well, in uh, Genesis, it doesn't say that, right? It says they shall become one flesh. Now it's clearly about two, Adam and Eve, it's husband and wife. There's only two people in the, in the formula. But when Jesus adds the word two, the number two, that taps into an additional debate that's going on at the time. So let me share with you some background information. This is stuff you probably don't expect when you usually sit down to a Bible study. But I think it's kind of neat. Um, basically, this, it goes like this. The people who become one flesh are numbered in two, and therefore polygamy violates the nature of marriage the desire of the design, I should say, of marriage, because it's two that become one. Um, David and Stone Brewer's done a lot of research on this in particular. He has a whole section in his book on marriage and divorce where he talks about this, but let me quote him a little bit. He says, the use of Genesis 2.24, that's the verse Jesus quoted with the number two, to prove monogamy was by this time very widespread. It was like a standard proof text for people who were saying that polygamy was wrong and monogamy was the way God wanted us to be. They would talk about two becoming one. But when they quoted it, they would have the word two with Genesis 2.24. And then those who seemed to be against monogamy or for polygamy, they wouldn't quote it with the word two because they wanted to leave that door open. In the Qumran caves, we found a bunch of scrolls, ancient Dead Sea Scroll content, right? One of them is called the Damascus document. In the Damascus document, chapter four and chapter six, we have the following phrases. I'll be read it to you. It says, they are caught by two snares by sexual sin, namely taking two wives in their lives, while the foundation of creation is male and female he created them. 
And those who entered Noah's Ark went in two by two into the Ark. Now, this little, this little section I quoted to you, they're caught by two snares, meaning that people who do fill in the blank, this sin, in this case, it's polygamy, they're caught by two issues. One, it, they're committing a sexual sin because they take two wives when two are supposed to become one. And then it goes on and quotes the Ark, which is an interesting proof text. Two by two, they went into the Ark. And they're like, see, the it's two by two, guys. Two by two, not three by one. <laughs> Two by two, they went in pairs, and that's how it's supposed to be. Now, originally, um, and even 15, 20 years ago, scholars were thinking, many of them, that this was arguing against remarriage, not polygamy, because it says two wives in their lifetime. So they thought that they were arguing against remarriage, not polygamy. But that's not the case. And so in David Instone's David Instone Brewer's book, chapter six, and the book's called Divorce and Remarriage in the Bible, the Social and Literary Context, he gives a whole long argument of why this is not really about uh, remarriage, it's about polygamy. And so I just refer you to that if you want to chase that rabbit. But here's what he says on the meaning of this quote and its connection to Jesus and his sayings in the Gospel of Mark in particular. Let me quote David and Stonebrewer. By linking the two texts, the exegete can infer that male and female in 127 of Genesis is further defined by the phrase two by two in chapter 7 verse 9 of Genesis. This means that the use of this phrase in 127 implied that marriage involved only two people. Marriage is not actually mentioned in 127, but in the following verse, God tells the male and female to multiply. This verse was the basis of the rabbinic law that all men should marry and have children. So marriage is implied in 127. It is likely that these texts formed a well-known proof for monogamy. This is suggested by the fact that the wording in Mark and the Damascus document is very similar. Both Mark and the Damascus document cite exactly the same portion of Genesis 127. And they both precede the quotation with a very similar phrase. Mark refers to the beginning of creation. Remember how Jesus said at the beginning of creation, it was not so. While, and I'm quoting him again now, while the Damascus document used the phrase, the foundation of creation, to introduce the topic, they are semantically identical. So in other words, the Damascus document and some people writing, you know, the Qumran scrolls, they're saying monogamy is the way Genesis proves it. Here's our proof text. And they seem to be, Jesus seems to be echoing the same things that they were saying at the time. Meaning, uh, and, and it's not like we have to think everything Jesus said originated with him. It's not like he's the only one to say things. The thing is that the verbal connections between Jesus's argument and their argument imply that Jesus really is arguing for monogamy against polygamy, as well as trying to restore our hearts on marriage. So I think that that's worth noting. It's worth noting. The point here is, Oh, let me give you more as well. Um, so in Mark 10, 8, we get the word two as well again. In Mark 9, Matthew 19, 8, another parallel passage, we get the word two being used in the topic of marriage. Two become one, two become one, two become one. It's about two. So the point is that the nature of marriage is God's design and God's action. It's more than a mere contract that you have a right to break whenever you want. Two become one. It can be ended. The two can stop be being one. But the joining has happened and it should be honored. It's more than a mere contract. Many couples who are thinking about marriage need to stop wrestling with whether they have a right to divorce and first ask the question. Now, I think there are some who, who have a right, are in a right position to divorce. I think that does happen. But I think many people who are debating divorce and probably the majority of divorces that take place in our culture, they actually shouldn't. And the couple should stop and remember what marriage is in the first place, not just what marriage does for them. Ask yourself, have I forgotten that this thing is holy? That God called, God, not just my husband, not just my wife, who I'm irritated with and I'm bitter towards and my heart is hard towards, but God calls me to be one with them. Love them self-sacrificially. Ask yourself if you've forgotten this. That is, relationship of seeing that God is the one that joins them. He's the action, he's the one joining them, right? It means that my relationship, while it's between two people, it really involves a third, God. And when I see that, and I, it gives me the, for me as a married man, it gives me the ability, the capacity to say, I will love my wife for him. 
even if I'm having a hard time finding it in my heart to love her for her because of my bitterness. Not that I've ever been bitter ever about anything or anyone in any way ever. But I can imagine that would help someone else if they were struggling. Um, so I'll share that you know, for you guys. Um, therefore, don't separate what God's joined together. Um, now, so any matter of divorce, clearly Jesus blows us out of the water. If you think divorce is just a right, um, well, I'm not happy, so I'm getting a divorce. Or we have mutual disagreements, so I'm getting a divorce. Like, that's immoral. It doesn't mean you didn't actually get a divorce, but it was wrong. You should have stayed together. You shouldn't have done that. Not as a Christian, not as a follower of Jesus. And I'm not trying to... Uh, control everyone's lives. We're talking about what's right and what's wrong here. And that doesn't change whether we like it or not. We should strive to keep the unity. Our culture is so selfish that they do think it's a right to divorce. They do think it's like, well, me, me, me. I'm not happy. And I'm just not happy with them anymore. And I think I deserve to be happy. And we start with a focus on me, not on the Lord, with well, a focus on me, not on what this marriage actually is. And then we, well, no wonder why the marriage is falling apart. The purpose of the marriage was serving me instead of the two of us, you know, picturing what God has created in this oneness and this glory and this beauty, the relationship of Christ in the church and then serving him in my marriage. You know, you can get away with being more selfish when you're single, but when you get married, like a lot of those selfish things become very obvious to you. And you're like, golly, you know, what's God? I wasn't expecting this. And that's pretty normal for married couples to experience that for a while. And you learn that it's not about you and that you're, you have an opportunity to die to yourself. When here you thought <laughs> you were going to be like, you complete me. But in reality, sometimes marriage is more like you hack off large portions of me, you know, <laughs> Portions of me that are probably ungodly and that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place, but that is many times the nature of marriage. All right, back to verse 10. We'll finish off these last three verses. It says, in the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. So they went to, you know, in private, they're like, Jesus, we got some problems with your teaching. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she's committing adultery. Jesus, he adds now a new concept. He was talking about just divorce is, you know, problematic. But now he's like, look, if you do it and marry another. Jesus does this in all four of the biblical accounts of him talking about marriage and divorce. In Matthew, in Luke, and in Mark, uh, twice in Matthew. He talks about this every time. You divorce and marry another, that's adultery. He always mentions that. I think we can summarize it this way. If you get a divorce, it doesn't necessarily free you from your moral obligation to your spouse. You may well be morally obligated to, to get back together. That divorce may be wrong. Now, there can be justified divorces. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you're in that state where you're not justifiably divorced, then to marry another is an adulterous act. You're still divorced from them, but because he said you get divorced, so you're divorced. But you do it and you marry another. Or... If you get divorced to marry another, which this is what happens so many times. I've talked to people who are on in a, in a rough and troubled marriage. And so often, the reason why they decided to just say, okay, fine, I want a divorce, was because they found another prospect, another guy, another girl, who they started letting into that like wife type space that like maybe they said they're just a friend. But you know, it was that. It was that kind of filling that void that you felt was missing from your spouse. And then you let them into that space. And now, now I feel the courage to divorce. And I've heard them, seen them swear up and down. Well, it's not because of them. I'm divorcing for my own reasons. And I'm like, whatever you got to tell yourself. <laughs> but we all know. <laughs> we all know the truth. And your family knows the truth. And everybody, everybody God, and God knows the truth. Jesus just doesn't play any games, right? He's like, you divorce, you get married to another. That's adultery. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow. But what it means is that a husband and wife who separate in, under Christian principles are actually called to get back together. And we get this in 1 Corinthians 7. Because some people say this is just about Herod the Great, or you know, not, or not the Great, but Herod Antipas, who had uh, married a woman wrongly, and they think he's just talking about them. But actually, Paul the Apostle takes the words of Jesus and applies it to all Christians here, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11. He says, to the married, I give, this, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, meaning he's quoting Jesus here. 
You ever wondered what he meant when he said, not I, but the Lord? He means he's, he's actually quoting something Jesus taught while he was on the earth. That the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not divorce his wife. The first counsel I have for a marriage that is so bad off that divorce actually happens or separation is do not allow anybody into that space in your life that your husband or wife once filled. Don't let anyone into that space because that will put the death call onto your marriage. That, that will just destroy it. That'll be the end of it. Don't do that. Remain unmarried. Stay unmarried and seek reconciliation. Don't give up yet. Now, if you had a justified divorce because of things like adultery, because of extreme abuse scenarios, because of abandonment, I don't think that you're, I don't think you're bound by this. We're talking here about unjustified divorces. You have an unjustified divorce, you know it's wrong, but you did it anyways, or they forced it on you. Stay unmarried and seek reconciliation. That time apart might actually be a time for healing. It's possible and it's, and it's desired. But there are exceptions, right? Jesus gives an exception in Matthew 5.32 and in Matthew 19.9, he says, except for sexual immorality. If they commit sin against you, either during the marriage or even after the divorce, and they go and they sleep with somebody else, or they get married to someone else, that legitimizes the divorce, morally speaking, and you are no longer bound to them. That's my understanding of scripture. In 1 Corinthians 7.15, Paul adds another, and there's more details in my long teaching on this, but I'm going to summarize. If you have an unwilling unbeliever, that is, they won't listen to the church, they won't listen to Jesus, and they don't want to stay married to you, you're not obligated to stay in that marriage. You don't cause the divorce, but you yield to it because they will not submit to Jesus. You don't have the two Christians scenario where they will listen to the church. Now, you may even have, in my opinion, you can stretch this to a Christian in name who will not listen to Jesus and they want a divorce and they, and they say they're Christian, but they won't receive the church discipline that comes their way. They won't listen to the pastors and elders. Hey man, Jesus is telling you, you need to shape up. You need to come back to your wife. You need to go back to your husband. And they don't listen, but they're like, but I'm a Christian. Cause I've seen people say they're Christians all day long, but you know, <laughs> and so it's problematic. So if they will not listen to church discipline, the scripture gives us cause to treat them as an unbeliever. It doesn't mean they are an unbeliever. We don't know, but we treat them as an unbeliever. That's Matthew chapter 18. Jesus is like, yeah, look, the person won't listen to, to you, won't listen to the elders, won't listen to the whole church. Treat them as an unbeliever. Let him be to you as a heathen and tax collector. That's what it means. Treat them as, you don't hate them, but you categorize them as an unbeliever. Well, Paul's advice for unbelieving, unwilling spouses is that you are free from that commitment if, if that situation happens in 1 Corinthians 7.15. Um, there's some other things to mention. These are rarities, the, the, these exceptions, the adultery, um, extreme scenarios of abuse, or unwilling unbelievers who want out of the marriage. Those are exceptions. Those are not common things. They're rarities. Most divorce is immoral, and therefore, <clears throat> most second marriages were immoral when you entered them. That would be a biblical teaching on this. Now, if you've entered an immoral marriage, it was wrong to, to get married, you stay married. That is also a biblical principle. You shouldn't have done that. Well, you did it. Just like if you marry, you shouldn't marry an unbeliever, but if you do, you, then we're rooting for that marriage and we're praying for that marriage and we want it to be a beautiful, wonderful, good marriage. And I say the same thing's true about a wrongful second marriage. It doesn't remain a wrongful second marriage the rest of your life. It was a sin you committed and now you need to honor this marriage commitment. And uh, that's another controversial issue, which I get into more detail on in the big long video, which I will link below. And this also applies to women as well as men. This isn't just about men or women, it's about both, right? Um, because Jesus applies it both ways. She divorces, he divorces, whichever way it goes, it applies to both. The heart of marriage then is union from God and no two Christians both walking in obedience will ever need to divorce. No two Christians walking in obedience need to divorce. Well, we're both walking in obedience and we need to divorce. Well, you're probably not. You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. The bottom line is this. It's a reminder to live holy lives. Kind of sandwiched here in the middle of Mark and, and almost doesn't really flow with all the other things that are going on in the gospel of Mark, but in here because it's a central issue in human lives. Next to my relationship with Jesus, my relationship with my spouse is the most important one I will ever have. And so it's important for our lives. And that we don't be like the world who have all these millions of excuses, millions of ways out on, on divorce and remarriage, and we, we just honor Christ. God, you've made marriage holy. You've said the marriage bed is undefiled. 
This thing is holy. This thing is to become one. It's more than just an agreement to live together until we decide we don't like each other. And our call is not to live good person lives. As Christians, it's called to, we're called to live for God. My whole life for God. And this is such a good reminder for me, especially for those of us, many because of quarantine and stuff right now, you're not in fellowship. You're largely being exposed to the world a lot of the time. The media that you're watching, the stuff that you're consuming, and the worldly way of thinking a selfish, self-centered life where you try to be a good person, but there, it's not good in the sense of a life that is lived for God. Fully, I belong to God with everything that I am. I want to be a living sacrifice unto God. Like that's our call as Christians. It's so much more than like the version in the world of be a good person. And this is a good reminder for us. Jesus takes marriage and says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Like it's about, it's about the Lord. It's about the Lord. And when we get our hearts centered on that, that's sanctification. That is the work of the Holy Spirit within us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'd help us to um, see the relationships in our lives, Lord, um, especially marriage. See it the way you see it. To see our calling as husbands, those of us that are husbands, um, that we are called to die to ourselves and forgive and forgive and forgive and still be loving and still be gracious and still be kind, to be thoughtful, to, to recognize that our, our wife has the weaker vessel, as controversial as that is, yet she's not as strong physically mostly as the husband's. And that does create differences between us so that we would not be calloused and harsh towards her where, where that shouldn't happen. For wives, Lord, we pray that you'd, you'd help the wives hearing this to be aware of their calling to submit to their husband as unto you. And that this isn't about a battle, a power struggle between the two of them, but it's about them loving and serving and honoring you. Help us to see our roles in our marriages as an act of worship to our great Savior. And we pray, Lord, that if anyone's watching this even later who's on the brink of divorce, that they would stop and reset everything they know about what marriage is and who they're called to be. And that, God, if possible, Lord, that you would save that relationship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.